Lots of people assume that the Bible is nothing more than mythology. Without really knowing much about it, they assume that it's just a bunch of fictional stories like anything else you'd find in ancient literature. What they might find surprising is that the events and people of the Bible are often mentioned in extra-biblical records. For instance, about half the kings mentioned in the Bible are also named in other documents from the ancient world. One of these documents is a famous clay prism that mentions King Hezekiah and his victory over the Assyrian army. We're going to tell this story, and it begins in the 8th century BC. Hezekiah is on the throne of the southern kingdom. After the death of the Assyrian king Sargon II in 705, he rebels and refuses to pay tribute to the Assyrians. Now, this was often done when a powerful ruler died. Smaller kingdoms under the control of a larger empire would often try to break away and gain their independence, and that's what Hezekiah did. But if you were a king and chose to go this route, it usually meant that an army was going to wind up on your doorstep. And that's the situation that Hezekiah faced around the year 701 BC. Sargon's son Sennacherib invaded Judah about four years after his father's death. During this military campaign, he claims to have captured a number of fortified cities in Judea. One of the most famous conquests was the city of Lachish, which was memorialized in a series of stone panels that we call the Lachish Reliefs. We find an account of some events in this campaign in the Bible, in Isaiah chapters 36 and 37, 2 Kings 18 and 19, and 2 Chronicles 32. When the Assyrian army arrives at Jerusalem, a messenger asks to speak with Hezekiah. This person is known as the Rav Shekei, or the Rav Sheka. Now, this wasn't the man's name. This was a title for a high-ranking Assyrian official. But the man begins negotiations with Jerusalem, and he first tries to intimidate the people. He speaks in Hebrew so that everyone can understand him. And there are some Judeans who ask him to speak in Aramaic. This is in Isaiah chapter 36, verse 11. They say, please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. Do not speak to us in the language of Judah within the hearing of the people who are on the wall. Aramaic was the language of international diplomacy at this time in the ancient Near East. It's very similar to Hebrew, but perhaps not so much that the average person would have understood everything that was being said. Well, the Rav Sheka refuses to grant their request because he's engaging in psychological warfare. He's trying to demoralize the people. He wants them to break rank and turn on each other in order to help facilitate the conquest of Jerusalem. He tells the people that if they come out and make peace, then they're going to be permitted to go about their business until the Assyrians deport them. Now, they're still going to be deported, right? They're still going to have to suffer the consequences of their rebellion, but they're going to be very minimal. And the other option for the Judeans is to dig in, reject the Rav Sheka's offer, and be annihilated when the Assyrians destroy the city. Well, remarkably, the people of Jerusalem stand together in spite of the Rav Sheka's attempts to break their morale. Everyone is still distraught, of course, including Hezekiah. The Assyrian army was powerful, and they could be incredibly cruel. Stone carvings depict soldiers carrying around the severed heads of their victims or impaling captured prisoners, which seems to have been a regular occurrence. So Hezekiah prays to God for deliverance, and after this, the prophet Isaiah comes to pay the king a visit. He tells Hezekiah that Sennacherib will neither invade nor conquer the city, and he says that God's going to deliver them. At night, the angel of the Lord comes and destroys 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. When the survivors wake up in the morning, they find their dead companions, and Sennacherib is forced to go back home. Well, this is a huge victory for the people in Jerusalem. The Assyrian army almost never lost in situations like this. So the question is, is there any independent confirmation of these events? And the answer is yes, to a degree. We've got a record that doesn't mention everything we find in the Bible, but it does mention enough of the details that we know that the Bible is telling us the truth about what happened. The basic events of the encounter are recorded on at least three different clay prisms. The first is the Taylor Prism, currently in the British Museum. The second is the Chicago Prism in the Museum of the Oriental Institute in Chicago, Illinois. The third is the Jerusalem Prism in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. 
there are about eight other fragmentary copies that also exist. Well, all three documents tell us the same story with only minor variations. Sennacherib invades, he takes a number of fortified cities, he prepares to siege Jerusalem after cutting off every avenue of escape for the king and his people. And that's where the Assyrian sources tell us, as for Hezekiah, the Judean, I besieged 46 of his fortified walled cities and surrounding smaller towns, which were without number. Using packed down ramps and applying battering rams, infantry attacks by mines, breaches, and siege machines, I conquered them. I took out 200,150 people, young and old, male and female, horses, mules, donkeys, camel, cattle, and sheep without number, and counted them as spoil. He himself, I locked up within Jerusalem, his royal city, like a bird in a cage. This all sounds very impressive. Sennacherib brags about taking spoils of war. He says that he seized Jerusalem and left Hezekiah with nowhere else to go. In another section, he says that he imposed tribute payments upon Judah. And then he mentions going back home to Nineveh. What he does not record is any mention of the capture of the city of Jerusalem. Now, the Bible says that the Assyrians didn't conquer the city. Assyrian records don't mention the capture. Now, the question is why? And the answer is very simple, because Jerusalem didn't fall. If the Assyrians had captured the city, they would have made sure to include that detail. But Sennacherib would have never admitted that he was defeated because ancient kings loved to brag and they didn't record military losses in their royal histories. But the thing is, Sennacherib had to record something. Hezekiah did rebel. This is a matter of public record. And he needed to be taught a lesson. Otherwise, it would have emboldened other smaller kingdoms to follow suit. I can't afford to make exceptions. I mean, once word leaks out that a pirate has gone soft, people begin to disobey you, and then it's nothing but work, work, work all the time. So here's the story. Hezekiah rebels, and that triggers a response from the Assyrians. The Assyrian army gets more than it bargained for and goes home defeated. Sennacherib needs to spin this so that it looks like he came out on top. So he writes about how he invaded Judah, struck terror into the hearts of the king and all of his people, and then took all of these spoils of war. That makes it sound like any other successful military campaign against some rebellious king. And it sounds flattering because he leaves out the part where he fails to conquer Jerusalem and his army is defeated. What he does record actually lends credibility to the Bible. His refusal to mention the fall of Jerusalem is a tacit admission that he failed to conquer the city. It may not mention the reason why, but that's where we have the Bible to fill in those details for us. Sennacherib's failed invasion of Jerusalem was one of many cases where the archeological record supports the biblical text. Now that is not unusual. Many people don't realize that numerous biblical kings are mentioned in the ancient records of nations like Assyria and Babylon. While Hezekiah isn't the only example, he certainly is one of the best known.